Picture this. You're getting invited to a 90 minute presentation that will show every major innovation in digital technology for the next 50 years. The future is simply laid out in front of you, piece by piece. Well, this is exactly what happened on December 9th, 1968, in what went down in history as the mother of all demos. And does something like this exist today? Something that predicts the next 50 years of technological innovation? The year is 1945 and a young man named Douglas Engelbart was working in the US Army during World War II as a radar technician in the Philippines. And apparently he didn't bring his VR headset with him because to pass the time he ended up reading an article from the Atlantic that would inspire him and ignite his career for the rest of his life. The article was called as we may think, and it's planted in his brain the idea that machines could be used to augment human capabilities. Fast forward to 1960, and Doug is now working at SRI, the Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, and he got funding from the US government to make his vision a reality by building ARC. No, 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 not that ARC, the Augmentation Research Center. He laid out his vision in 1962 in his paper Augmenting Human Intellect, a conceptual framework, the typical light summer book that you see Instagram influencers read on the south of France. And it is on December 9th, 1968, that Doug would reveal to a crowd of a thousand computer scientists what he and his folks at the ARC came up with. The curtains open, and what followed is a 90-minute presentation about basically the next 50 years in digital technology. They showed the first mouse. We have a pointing device called a mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. Live video conference while simultaneously working on a shared document with another person located miles away. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face and we can talk. Hyperlinks and linked information, which is the foundation of the modern web. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that, and oh, I see overdue books and all. Interactive documents where you can copy, paste, and move around different statements, like Notion does today. Statement with a few words in it. Let's make more statements, I'll say copy that statement, and lo and behold, I have another one. And so much more. But consider this, we are in the 1960s. The Beatles were seen as misfits, corrupting the mind of kids with devilish lyrics like We all live in a yellow submarine. Ford was actually proposing nuclear-powered cars. Execution with the guillotine was still legal in France, and the guidance computer that got us to the moon and back in 1969 had 10 times less computing power than a modern USB charger. Before the presentation, Doug was seen as a charlatan, someone with his head in the clouds. But it took 90 minutes for him to be consecrated as a pioneer of information technology. And so after a thousand of the leading computer scientists of the time have been shown the path towards many of the most important innovations in computing interfaces of the next 50 years, what they did next is almost nothing. The ideas in the demo were deemed too out there, and for the next 15 years basically nothing that he presented saw a commercial release or attracted any significant attention. But a group of people working with Doug left ARC, and they joined Xerox Park, the research division of Xerox, the copy machine company. And here they built upon the ideas presented at the demo, and they came up with a graphical user interface, icons and windows, but they never understood the potential, and neither did Xerox. See, Xerox made a deal with a young man named Steve at a new company called Apple Computers, and part of this deal was allowing them to take a peek inside Park. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. This historical visit will lead Apple to launch the Macintosh in 1984. And the rest, well, it's history. But wait a second. Today, thousands of new technologies and ideas are presented every year. And so what if the demo that outlines the next 50 years of technology is already out there? Of course, it's easy to see that the mother of all demos was so revolutionary now, but it's almost impossible to predict which vision for the future will end up actually happening. If I could do that, I would probably not be here. I would be maybe in Dubai on a Lambo and selling some kind of course. And so I started a journey on the wasteland that is the internet to find something. 
a presentation of a beta version of the future, something that can work in its basic form today, but that also has the potential and also the utility of being scaled to billions of people. And I actually found something, three demos that outline three visions for the decades to come. The first one is called Sixth Sense, a technology presented in 2009 by Pranav Mystery. He uses a projector attached to his chest and a set of cameras to create the experience of augmenting the physical objects that he encounters in the real world. And if it sounds familiar, it's because yes, it is augmented reality. It's no secret that I'm a huge advocate for mainstream augmented reality, and this demo, which is almost 13 years old, shows in a very rudimental form the many ways we can enhance our physical world and remove the need for a phone or a computer screen. He uses a wall to project his computer screen and manipulates information with his hands, even plays Pong with other people in the metro to pass the time. And of course, we don't have this yet, we don't interact with the world in this way, but tech companies are pouring billions into augmented reality technology today. And I believe the vision that Pranav showed is getting closer and closer. The second possible successor for the matter of all demos is coming from the University of Washington, where in 2014 they showed the first rudimental demo of brain-to-brain -brain communication. One person was sending basic pieces of information from one brain to another. And while this might seem a bit out there, there are already companies like Neuralink that are working on similar problems. And this will solve one of the key limitations of computing, which is the bottleneck of human I.O. Today we work on computers that are incomprehensibly powerful and they could get a person work done from a computational point of view probably in a few seconds. But the time we take to communicate with the machine, whether it's moving a mouse or tapping on a keyboard and then our brain registering back the feedback of the screen is limiting the potential of human-machine collaboration. And eliminating the bottleneck and talking directly to the machine is something that can explode what humans and machines can do together. And communicating feelings and thoughts directly to other people also gives us the opportunity to create completely new mediums and industries. So maybe instead of movie directors, we'll have thought directors creating situations that we can experience not through a screen, but by actually perceiving and living. The third demo is more conceptual, but it looks at a more human way of building technology. Ted Hunt, the designer who built this demo, believes that in what we are building today, we lost the original spirit of Doug Engelbart, augmenting human intelligence. In his view, machines are becoming more intelligent thanks to AI, but these technologies are losing the purpose of augmenting human intellect. The products we use every day have been optimized for simplicity, for making everything seem immediate and effortless. But is that always the better option? To explain this philosophy, he envisioned a new kind of search engine called ELSE. While Google's search results are powered by one algorithm shaping what we see, else is built to let you choose which angle you would like to take. For example, making you question your questions using the Socratic method, instead of getting a quick answer from Google. In today's tech world, making the user reflect, question or choose is not in the radar of most companies, as this won't increase engagement or create a seamless digital experience. But I chose this example because it represents a future where we may start to actually build tech products with different incentives, instead of delegating everything to an algorithm. One of the most talked about features right now is one where AI is getting better than humans. And if you want to take a peek into how AI technology available today is so shockingly good at human things like art and creativity, check out this other video I made on the AI model Dolly 2 right here.